Who among you did not see it on TV? Show of hand for anybody who did not see it on TV. Few of you. Ah, you're my new besties. You see, in my case, my excuse was that I was in outer Mongolia. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, the download internet speed, even in the smallest little village, was 175 megabits a second. But, so I was in Outer Mongolia, so I didn't really know what happened until we came back and we sort of saw stuff on TV and the radio. And apparently, Richard Harris... Now, yeah, he did a really incomprehensible song called MacArthur Park, where I left a cake out in the rain, but I don't know if I can get it, make it again because I lost the recipe and I'll never see that cake again. Or, and, and he was also Albus Dumblebee um, in Harry Potter. And so I really had no deep understanding. And then you got Australian of the Year, which is a fantastic honour. And so this is time for me to actually catch up. So what I thought I did, I said, look, Macquarie University, look, I want to find out what happened. Can you just sort of line up, get a few of my thousand best friends, and we'll just find out exactly what happened and how he went down that pathway to actually do what he did. Um, but... Because it's me here, I'm going to be putting in some extra added sciencey goodness, adding on top of Richard's fa fabulous story. Um, this journey will be apparently available in a book called Against All Odds, apparently, coming oh. out on November 5. Oh. Did I guess right? I'm glad you brought that up, Carl. Yeah. yeah. Just in time for so, Christmas. Yeah. So do yourself a favour and go out and get it. And shortly afterwards, there'll be a podcast released of this, talking about what went on there, which will give you an extra viewpoint on it. And then you can play the video and then just sort of immerse yourself in it three ways. <laughs> so the first thing, which I actually asked you, I have to ask you, what do I mean by chambers? So does that mean like there's a bit where you can crawl through and then uh, that's, that's chamber one and then there's air and then you have to dive underwater and that's chamber two and you have to dive underwater, that's chamber three and then you have to dive underwater. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of caves like this uh, are made up of different chambers and I think we've got a slide, um, if we can show that first slide, which shows the, uh, the, p the main part of the show cave, which is the first thing that the public will see and, and walk into. Uh, not usually when it's got a river flowing through it like it has in this photograph, but in the dry season, um, this is a beautiful show cave. You can see the different coloured lights there and there's a nice concrete path. You can walk in for a few hundred metres and many of you will have been to show caves around the country like Janolan and... Um, down at Tantanula and, and big beautiful chambers. These aren't particularly well decorated, but they've got a few uh, what we call speleothems, the stalactites you can see in the, in the photograph there. And then the cave will constrict down into a smaller tunnel and then it will open up into another chamber and that's often the way these sort of caves um, go. And the, this particular cave is formed by a combination of dissolution of the limestone with that acidic uh, water flowing through the cave and dissolving the limestone but also through the passage of water with the annual monsoon season, which mechanically scours the cave and, and opens it up, um, making it into a basically a long river cave in, in the monsoon season. Now, I notice over here, over on the left, yeah, yeah see that? Mate, do they always have these high-powered floodlights just aimed in your eyes? Um, or is well that, that something put in for you guys? Those, those big air, I think they're gas-filled lights, um, are very commonly used by the emergency services, so that one wouldn't have normally been in there, but the, the colourful lights around the ceiling um, do live in there, and they're part of the show cave open to the public. OK, now over here it says danger on this sign, and down at the bottom I can hear, see that it says July to November is cave, the cave flooding season yep so, so were they in that window well the the boys went in on the 23rd of june so in theory a week before the the danger period so they should have had bags of time up their sleeve like a, a week they should have had would, a couple of weeks but you would expect a sign like this to be con pretty conservative i know when i see the jellyfish sign up in queensland or the crocodile sign if it's if it gives you a, a, a time frame you'd hope to be uh, you know pretty accurate you'd, you'd be safe outside of that that's that time Okay, so that's the sign that they would have seen. Mm. And they went in, in good faith. And um, they'd been in there many times before, yeah. of course, and they're locals. They well, know, why were they, they going know. in on this occasion? Um, so this is the Wild Boars or the Mupa soccer team, uh, 12 boys from this soccer team and their 25-year-old coach. And they'd been in there on many occasions and it was customary to often go in there on a special occasion, maybe a new player in the team or um, on this occasion, one of the boys' 15th birthday party that day. So the, oh. the task was to go in for about five kilometres in this 
10 kilometres of cave passage that was known in this cave. They were going to go in about halfway, write their names in the mud at the back of the cave, not something we encourage in uh, Australia with cave conservation ethics, but um, nonetheless in this entire land apparently that's, that's okay. And to be fair, it would be scoured every year with the monsoon, so their, their initials in the mud would quickly be washed away. So they were going to take this boy in there, sign their names, and then come out in time for birthday cake at about 5pm. So that was uh, today's your birthday? Today's my birthday. I'm what guessing four. Who's, who's got a birthday today? Show of hands. Hand. Little finger. Not one. I think there's a, a, a yeah. shy one down over there somewhere. Okay, I would have thought there'd be about two or three. By the way, the number is that if you've got 23 people in a room, the odds are better than 50% that two will share the same birthday. Moving right along. <laughs> so, <laughs> over here we're seeing a bunch of bicycles. So okay. this is the same um, aspect that we're looking at here, except yep. you can see there's no water in the cave. So this was the first evening, probably, um, when the boys were noted to be missing. This is what day of the week? Uh, Saturday, Saturday so evening. They, so this is taken, and they're already stuck. So the water has risen inside. Inside but, but the water's come coming up. all the way down. That's right. So they're wow. uh, several kilometres into the cave. The water has trapped them where they are. Yep. Um, but the water hasn't yet come out the entrance of the cave. And... That's their bicycles. Yep, 13 bikes tied up, which is a pretty obvious clue that something's not quite right. <laughs> wow. In Good. retrospect, that's so chilling. So, yeah. so where in Thailand is it? So we're right up the very northern part of Thailand on the border of Myanmar, formerly Burma. And is that area with uh, Laos to the northeast and Myanmar to the northwest used to be called the, the Golden Triangle. And the, interestingly, the Australian Federal Police divers who we worked with in, in Thailand said that, um, you know, a lot of opium used to come down through Thailand and probably end up in Australia. But they said the, the trade route is still open and business is quite good. It's just the product has changed. It's now methamphetamine. As, uh, ah. as, uh, so it's kind of a, a slightly sketchy area, I think, in terms of what goes on up in the jungle. But, um, yeah, we're in this tiny little town called Mae Sai Village. Uh, right on the border. In fact, the back of our hotel sat on the river which formed the border into Myanmar. Wow, so you could have jumped in the river and swum to freedom in the could have glorious people's yeah, Republic of Myanmar. Yeah, I think swimming to freedom, but in the wrong direction, maybe. <laughs> okay, so it's a road. I can see some greenery, which has had, and then, wow, is that, is that the monsoon cloud there? Yeah, is so, the cloud? This, so this, this hotel we're in in, in Maasai, it was literally 15 minutes in a van down to the entrance of the cave, and this is a little track that's leading up off the main road towards the cave, and I just remember when I took this photograph, I was looking out thinking how pristine and beautiful the jungle and the mountains were in this area, but of course, at the same time, just looking at these clouds, uh, monsoon clouds dumping rain into the cave, um, and, um, you know, the water in the cave was obviously a major, a major issue. So when you say cave, this cave is actually a long system, a bunch of lines of caves. And I can see here there's one coming in from the top and a couple of red arrows and a green arrow. Yeah, so this map was made by some uh, French speleologists who... Um, Technical word. Is this a Greek or a Latin please, root? Oh, gee, I th one sounds of those. Greek. Sounds Greek to me. I, th I think we've got a, s a person here who speaks ancient Greeks. Where are you, <laughs> Alice Woman? Is it Greek or Latin? Yeah, yeah spelio course. sounds Greek. I, I was just checking if you knew. Sounds yes, Greek. Spelios, yes, it's definitely um, Greek. So it's a Greek group. So they're people who go underground. Yep. We must never call them spelunkers, Carl. It's what? A, we they must used to never use spelunkers? the word spelunkers. It's quite an offensive term to us who are serious about our caving. I won't even discuss it any further. No, Lay no, it on so me, man. Um, right on, bro. So the, the arrow on the top right is the entrance to the cave, the main entrance, that show cave area. Oh, so... The arrow on the top right is the entrance, and if yep. you were to turn to the left, that'd be a different experience, but they turn to the right. So we're going west from that first arrow, going past west. the next arrow, which is chamber three, which I think we'll come back to. It's kind of like became the advanced dive base inside the cave. Massive room, probably the size of this um, this hall, and big sand As big as this? There. Yeah, as big as this. Probably not as high, but certainly as large. Wow, but and to get there, you had to go underwater. Yep, underwater. Well, once things had got serious after the first sad day. Yeah. Okay. Now, am I going off mic here, or is that okay? I'm cool. Yeah. Thumbs okay. up. Thumbs yep. up from the back. Yeah. Um, now, if we keep going west, yep. um, we hit this T-junction, you can see, and to the north, straight up the top of the page, is an area called the Monks series of, of cave passages, which actually, when we got to that T-junction and had a look, we were underwater at this stage, the hole is literally about that big up into the monk series. It's like a rabbit hole. And 
no one would really go up there in their right mind, to be honest, because it's very tight and unpleasant. So we knew the kids wouldn't have gone up there. Yep. But that actually is the area where most of the water comes into the cave, down from that northern branch ah. of the cave. All the, all the water falling in the mountains into the catchment ends up in that bit of cave but and it, appears it, into the, uh, at the T-junction. What, what height of rock? Ground, does it have to filter through like a metre, 10 metres, 100 metres? Oh, 800 metres. 800? Meters. 800? Yeah, so there's a mountain range above this cave and it's about 800 metres. So uh, there's a time delay between the rain yep. falling and then gradually filtering through. And that's exactly what happened to these kids. There was no sign of bad weather, but there had been rain over the preceding few days and I think it had just appeared at that exact moment that they were in the cave. So they went in in fine weather and then mm -hmm. the water that was locked up in the system gushed through at the bottom after the yep. time delay. Exactly. 800 metres. Yep, and it's then it started raining on top of that. And the green arrow? The green arrow is where the boys ended up waiting for rescue, and the red circle at the bottom is where they actually went to to carve their initials into the mud. They actually went that far? So they, they were pretty handy little cavers. They were intrepid lads. It would have been... I don't want to put a chill on it, but it would have been a lot more difficult if they'd been trapped up at the Red Circle. Uh, they wouldn't have been alive because there was no high ground any further than that green arrow, so they were just in the right place at the right time. Or, was that or the wrong place at the wrong time, depending how you look at it. Yep. But they, they were in the only spot where they could possibly have hung out for a few days. Yep, everywhere else was um, flooded at different times, I would say. Okay, now we, so that's Saturday-ish, mm -hmm. so now we're moving up to Sunday and Monday. Yeah, so when, in the early hours of Sunday morning, you know, the rescue authorities appeared on scene, they went into the cave as far as that T-junction, they turned left and then they hit water in front of them. And just beyond them, unbeknownst to them at that time, the boys were sitting on the other side, actually on a flat bit of sand. And um, the, the boys had actually attempted, well their coach had, to swim through that short bit of water to um, find help. And, th and that's it, they're in Chamber 9? What became known as yeah, Chamber yeah, right, 9, okay, yeah. 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 So, th so th at this stage it's all almost one continuous... So he attempted to swim through? Yeah, so they had a coil of rope with them and the coach tied the rope around his middle and he gave the end of the rope to the two strongest boys and he said, I'm going to try and swim through the water, which was coffee coloured, so you know, he wouldn't have been able to see anything. Like so zero visibility? Yep, so pretty courageous. Wow swam through that bit of water and he said, if I feel like I'm going to run out of breath, I'll pull vigorously on the rope and I want you guys to haul me in. And that's exactly what happened. So he was lucky to actually survive that first uh, attempt to swim through that sump, that, that water-filled bowl of, um, of, of cave passage. Wow. And what is, the, what, what is the blue bit on the monk's cave, the top area? Well, show? that's my... Illustrating skills showing oh. you that's where the water's coming uh, down. Besides yeah. the new book, he's offering services as a Photoshop designer. Yeah. Yeah. Top work, right yeah, on. Thanks. So th that was the water gradually coming in, and that's yep. on the Saturday and Sunday, and then the Tuesday. So oh very quickly. God. And, you know, these boys uh, were looking at the water in front of them and could see it rising through the floor uh, in front of them. So the groundwater's filling and, and coming up into the cave. So they started to retreat. The first night they slept on a bit of sand not far back into the cave, but then the next morning the water's lapping at their feet and they had to go further deeper into the cave when they found this ledge up to their right as they're heading back in and very high ledge 12 15 meters 45 degree mud slope and a very a small flat platform at the top and that's where they sat for two weeks wow mm. but that meant because it was shallow the distance that they had to get underwater was vastly increased yeah so by the time um, the British divers arrived, which was another couple of days later. Um, basically, this river was now flowing out of the entrance and not just flowing, but a very powerful, vigorous, frothy brown river flowing out of the entrance. And it was impenetrable. So these, these British guys tried to force their way into the cave. Uh, they had their scuba gear, they're very experienced cave divers. And even by pulling themselves hand over hand on the rocks, they were unable to get into the force of the water, they just got spat out. So they had to sit around for a few days, repeated attempts until the river started to quieten down sufficiently that they could make a bit of progress. It took a few days even before they could put the rope in? Yep. Was it uh, like uh, a skinny 
string or was like a diameter of my wrist? What was, what's no, it? so in any sort of rescue or recovery operation, that first line that you lay into the cave is absolutely critical and it has to be bomb-proof, basically. So because everyone else who goes in and out of the cave for the rescue is then going to drag their hands on it and pull on it and, and use it to pull themselves into the cave. So they actually used 11 millimetre climbing rope. Like my little finger yeah. diameter? Yeah, so very yeah. strong, uh, unbreakable almost in, in this sense. And um, every 50 metres or so, as they managed to push their way into the cave, they would tie it off to a stalactite on the ceiling or a projection and um, until they you know, started to make some progress. Um, by the way, um, here's some extra sciencey goodness that I learned when I was about seven. Um, a stalactite hangs tightly onto the ceiling and a stalagmite, if it's good, might reach reach up from the bottom and meet up with the guy from the top. Is that right, by the way? Do I learn the That's right correct. thing? That's correct. And if they're friendly enough, they'll meet in the middle and form a pillar. And then right. happy days. They just get fatter then. Right. So they're in there. So, so uh, you, this next one shows us what it looks like from above, from above ground, from a satellite type photo. Yeah, this is looking north to south. And um, so, you can, again, you can see the main entrance to the cave, uh, chamber three, the great big room about 600 metres in. Uh, the T-junction where we took a nice left-hand turn and you could tell when you reached that T-junction for a couple of reasons because you're swimming through essentially zero visibility but suddenly you'd hit this clear patch of water, crystal clear patch of water and for some reason that, well, obviously the, the filtered water from the northern arm of the cave coming into this junction and you'd hit this beautiful clear patch of water and it was also warm, like a, a degree ah. or two warmer than the water you were in which underwater, even a degree difference is really noticeable. You go, ooh, this is nice, I'll sit here for a bit. And then you go around the corner to the left and head south and then you're back into the, the murk and it's cold and disgusting again. And this is your fan club that you would see on? <laughs> yeah, so this was my first experience of the media and yeah. my, my uh, fear of the media hasn't really improved greatly since then, but I'm, I'm getting better at it. Right. So this is what we basically opened the door of the van the first time we arrived on scene and this was um, what was waiting for me. And I see that each and every night you had a vast array of foods left for you as you came out of the cave, stinking badly or perhaps not? Well, you know, the, this community grew around the entrance to the cave, this, this satellite city, if you like supporting the rescue and by the time we left we were told there were around 10,000 people involved on or around this mountain. 10, so you can imagine thousand. the logistics that go into supporting that community with food, toilets. Uh, they were offering free, free haircuts um, <laughs> and... Uh, yep. You wouldn't have needed one. <laughs> yeah, I was I. thinking about you, Carl. Uh, so um, w w when you came out there was still some food left for no. you? No. Sadly, we came, at, came out at sort of nine o'clock at night and by the time we got there, these beautiful ladies and their big woks were all gone and um, all that was left for us was some buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because ah. one of those kids in the cave had sent out a message once they were found. One of the messages said, um, can't wait to come out and have KFC. And of course, the local chicken emporium took this very earnestly and... Um, decided to supply all the rescuers with buckets of KFC and that's pretty much all we ate for the week. Wow. Yeah. Well, number one, they are the largest chicken retailer in the known universe. Number two, the combined weight of all the chickens on earth is three times greater than the weight of all of the other birds. Um, when you finish with your chicken bones, they go into the landfill and they do not break down in the anaerobic environment, so they stay and get mummified and in future times people will look back on this age as the age of the chicken. Right. <laughs> now, you mentioned the British guys. How do some people fly all the way from the other side of the world to Thailand, and, and, and what were their skills and what line of work do they do in the daytime? Is this the British guys? Yeah, so these are the two uh, main protagonists. Um, Rick Stanton on the left there, he's a retired firefighter from Coventry. Um, like a lot of cave divers, he seems to have winkled out of uh, any kind of real work, like my friend Craig Challen, the former veterinary surgeon, seems to be able to just go diving for a living. I'm not sure, I'm, st I'm still working on that. Um, uh, write 44 books. Oh, 40, <laughs> 45. 
And the other chap is, um, he is an earnest, uh, honest soul, he still works, he's got an IT company, John Valanthan from Bristol. These two guys are probably the, you know, the pinnacle of cave diving explorers in the world at the moment, and um, they, they're really revered in this small, strange community of cave diving uh, around the globe. And fortunately, we already knew these guys from some previous expeditions. Um, so this is how I became involved through my friendship with Rick, um, who was on, on, on the ground from that first Wednesday uh, after the kids went in on Saturday. And these were the guys who laid the rope through the cave and eventually found the children. And many of you will have seen that little bit of video footage from John Valanthan's uh, GoPro camera when he says, how many of you are there? And the kids go, 13. And he goes, brilliant. Wow. Very, very so terribly British. They were locked in there on a Saturday night. When did you arrive? So we didn't arrive until 10 days later. Was it the fo no, 11 or 12 days later? The so following the, Thursday. So the Brits had already laid... Yep, they'd been there for a week, working hard, but sorting it, took them it all out. a few out. days even just to be able to fight the roaring onslaught. What, yep. what sort of difficulty would you have? Like, firstly, obviously, you couldn't see anything underwater. It'd be well, just total muddy. How do you know that you're going in that direction versus that direction? You might get turned well, around. Well, you've got strong flow coming out of the cave, so you just point your nose into the, uh, into the flow, and uh, Rick is actually famous for the size of his nose, so he's uh, very good at that. Oh, uh, oh I think they're a catty group, these yeah, no. non-spelunkers. It's just one of the jokes that, that is made about Rick. Um, so they were, I mean, there was zero visibility. You can picture you might as well have your eyes closed. You're feeling the rocks in front of you. Uh, you might find a rock there, and so you feel to the right, there's a bit of a hole there, so you'll, you'll drag your bag of, of caving rope with you and, and force your way through, just find the strongest flow and swim into that. And they had a few mis misfires, a few wrong turns, and had to come back out and continue in the main passage. But extraordinarily skillful, extraordinarily skillful and courageous bit of diving, actually, to lay that line. How long would it take? How well, many hours? It took days and days of about sort of 12 hours in the cave each day. What, so they'd lay the, ca the rope down and then bang it into the sand? Well, it could only take a few hundred metres of rope each dive, you know, because it's thick rope, it's in a big sack. Uh, it's not the normal way we lay line in a cave. We've normally got hundreds and hundreds of metres on a spool that runs out behind us and we just tie that off. But in a high-flow cave, which is going to erode or... or um, um, you know, damage to the line, or knowing that people who will follow will be pulling themselves along the rope, they had to make sure it was uh, really solid. And what about the students, the kids, the soccer team? They were in dark? For, did they have lights at any stage? Yeah, they all took in their sort of $2 head torches that they got from the local 7-Eleven, and um, once they realised they were trapped, they were actually really sensible. They, they conserved their lights, only allowed one person to have a light on at a time. I think they stayed in the dark as long as they were brave enough to turn on a, a light occasionally for a bit of morale. The coach, who you know, was an older guy, 25, he had spent three years as a monk, and so he had his wits together, and I think he played a really important role in keeping them all calm and um, keeping them... Thoughtful and busy, and uh, yeah, keeping things under control. So that's the British team there, and who are these incredibly handsome? Well, then the one on the left looks like he might be an author almost. Into the Australian contingent. Um, so we were deployed as the smallest ever Osmat team from the Australian government. Osmat is the Australian Medical Assistance Team, and I'd done this training quite a long time ago up in Darwin. You go up there and learn how to set up a field hospital, and you have these hundreds of logistics people, firemen and army people with you. Um, and so I was the team leader and Craig was my sheriff and um, he had to be quickly uh, anointed with the Osmat, you know, sword and uh, then off you go. Now you're official employees of, employees of the Australian government and uh, the smallest ever team to be deployed from our shores. So for the duration of this, you were actually a government agent? Uh, yes, I like that. <laughs> I was. Just checking. Yeah. Now... What is this? Well, this is the mud, um, which was pretty ubiquitous at the site, and they started to lay some gravel around to try and, um, you know, when it started to get knee-deep, to, to make it easier to move around the site. And then they started to make these roads out of pallets, and by the end of it, I had a sense of maybe what the Somme might have been like towards the, you know, towards the end, just everyone waiting around in the mud and, you know, trying to 
trying to uh, get around without getting covered in. But these are above ground. This is you guys. Where are you? And what's that blue pipe? And why does the water look jumping up in the air? So this and is frozen um, in time. This is just the last bit of cave before we walk around that big boulder and we're back into the daylight of that of that um, show cave chamber. Um, so we've actually stopped. This is the outlets of one of the uh, submersible pumps that they've put inside the cave, and it offered a very good spot to wash all the mud off before we came out of the cave into oh, the so daylight. So we're actually on our way out, and I just got one of the um, other divers in there to take a photo of us having a bit of a bath in the pump outlet. So you're on the way out, and you're, you're just washing yourself in that water. Yep. Um, and that blue pipe is carrying water that's being pumped out by a submersible pump. Correct. Where does the submersible pump get its power supply? Uh, massive generators outside the cave entrance, uh, like banks and banks. Yeah, I mean, it was a huge operation. You can imagine the logistics there. But that means if the pumps are submersible, that they're submerged, that they're underwater, I assume and the, electricity yes. is going to them. Yes. And there was so you're swimming in water where there's electric Well, you assume alive? the fact that the pumps are submersible is that they've thought that part through. Um, <laughs> and Sometimes uh, it's good where you don't have to reinvent the no. wheel and you can trust other people. But, you know, these electric cables clearly had, you know, three-phase power running through them, very high voltage, and it, I, I was conscious of this, Carl, I have to say. Wow. So... You jumped into the water knowing that there was already live 415 volt it's in it, right, okay. Mm. Now, this is sort of shades of brown. What are we looking at here? So fortunately, the whole operation didn't hang on the divers at this stage. And I, I can tell you, I was looking for any way out of being directly involved in uh, a diving operation to bring these children out of the cave. It's almost impossible. Well, I, I actually told everyone that it is, I give it 0% chance of success. I do not think that we can anaesthetise these boys, put them underwater and safely bring them out for what would be about a three-hour dive. By so the way, w w when an anaesthetist is in charge of somebody um, who's unconscious, they do not sit there reading the newspaper, flipping over, doing the crossword and stuff like that, but they've got a little machine through which they, the, the person's gas comes out. And this gas includes carbon dioxide, and you've got a laser pointed through it. Yeah, by the way, carbon dioxide is absorbed by... Infrared is absorbing into carbon dioxide. And so you monitor them, and here you could not monitor them. There's no way, once you've made them unconscious, that you can then continue to do your duty to keep them alive every single... Because mm. they're underwater, and at this stage you're dealing with, like, a bag of fruit that... We, OK, so... Wow. OK, so, so what, what is this guy so above water? Just to touch on all the other plans that were in yeah, place, yeah. And, and most of it revolved around lowering the water level in the cave or getting the water out oh, of the, the cave. Oh, the big pumps. So this, this photo shows a massive drill rig that was just by the entrance to the cave, and it was drilling down into the aquifer, into the groundwater, and pumping uh, billions and billions of litres of water out of the aquifer, and thereby hopefully just lowering the level of the water throughout the whole cave. So if we could make an airspace throughout the cave where there was no true diving so you didn't have segments. to go do chamber one, chamber yeah, two. Yeah, we could just then snorkel or swim the kids out of the cave. And then float them in. If their nose has got to this close to the ceiling, that's OK. Yep, we call that a roof sniff. You're kidding. I mean, there's <laughs> just, just enough room for your nose to go through. OK, so we're, we're learning two things. You're not allowed to use the K words. But you're not allowed to use that. No. And secondly, as a phrase, a roof sniff. A roof sniff, which I have to say is my least favourite part of caving. Right. For obvious reasons. Uh, let me just detour. Why on earth do you go ca caving when you could lie back on the lounge and have a nice cup of tea with tea leaves and a scone? Uh, because Matthew Flinders found all the countries. <laughs> Yo. OK, so he's full of mud and they're trying to lower the level. Yep. So I'm guessing this is where the muddy water... Yeah. Man. Now, have you ever Look been in those? Um, have you ever been in those pimped out um, vans in Bali or Phuket or places like that? Yo. And you know how they've got the flashing lights and all the big uh, hubcaps and stuff. These pumps look the same. I reckon they come from the same dealer. Uh, <laughs> they, they look like they've got drag racing motors on the back of them. They're all brightly coloured. Anyway, all this water is going out, and all of it ends up in the local rice farmers' paddies. And when we were over in Thailand in uh, April this year, visiting the boys and going back to the cave, we were told that 1,100 farmers lost their crops uh, voluntarily. 
I thought what water would that was good flow for on us. Be? Yeah. Would some of them then be so poor that in their education system they'd be no longer able to send their children to school? I don't know, but I think obviously a very big sacrifice uh, for the locals. So, you know, the sense of community around this rescue was extraordinary. There's so many people just putting in their time, effort, money, equipment. All these pumps and things all came from businesses all around Southeast Asia. It was extraordinary. So, oh, so these are proper, full-on, big industrial grade pumps, mm. submersible pumps. Everybody in the local area for a couple of thousand kilometres around send them across. I think so, yeah. Okay, so these so are that's, not pumps. What no, are they doing? so that, we've just talked about the downstream end of the cave. Now, that um, northern arm of the cave where all the water apparently accumulates and goes in, enters the cave, they sent all these guys up into the bush uh, pretty much just with hand tools, picks and shovels and sandbags, and they were basically corking up every hole in the ground that they could find that they thought water would go into. C-A-U-L-K? Uh, could a, be, yeah, yeah. As opposed to C-O-R-K. corking gun. But they would have the same thing. I was thinking C-O-R-K, but yeah, I'll take your point. Yeah, C-O-R-K, or a C-A-U-L-K, yeah, yep. one of those. Uh, corking. Blocking. Uh, blocking. Shoving something in the hole, yeah. okay, to Sand, stop it sandbags. draining. So were these guys at uh, 50, 100, 300, 800 metres above? Well, I never saw this. These photos are all stolen off the internet, and, um, but... <laughs> Where this, everything is true. Of course. Um, but this is what was going on. So I'm not exactly sure which part of the mountain they were, apart from the fact that it was above that northern section of the cave. And they dragged all these poly pipes up there, the blue pipes, uh, to try and divert water across you know, the next ridge around to a different valley so they'd drain the water there so it wouldn't end up in the cave. And the feeling from the water engineers was that this probably played a very important role in keeping the water static in the cave, if not draining it, at least it kept it at bay. Yeah, so you've got a constant flux of water of what's already in there, in the rock, and this is stopping more water being added to it. And so I'm guessing this is the water just being funneled away mm. from the potential entrance into the rocks and yep. then into the monk's cave and then into you guys. Mm. Wow. What are the uniforms? Are they military uniforms? I think they're a mixture of military uh, and um, the equivalent of the SES. And yep. what are we watching here now? So whilst everyone's trying to get the water out of the cave, of course, they're also trying to find a way down into the cave. So they... What, from above? From above. Wow. So they've got these guys who... Some of them were those fellows who uh, climbed the cliffs down in Krabi province and around Peepee Island, places like that, to get the swallow's nests uh, to make bird's nest soup. Wow. And so these guys are amazing athletes. They're like spider monkeys going up the cliffs to get the little bird's nests. And they were working on top of the mountain trying to find passageways down into the cave. Now, with 800 metres of rock between them and where the boys were, the chances of caving that sort of distance vertically was very, very remote. And we know from you know, worldwide major caving expeditions that that sort of distance penetration takes weeks with base camps and multiple, um, you know, teams. And so this was never likely to succeed uh, in all honesty. But, you know, no stern stone was being left unturned. Well, and then here we see the staff, the locals. Yeah, this is one of the medical teams in the cave just preparing and rehearsing for when the boys did come out, if they came out via the, the diving route. Because it was part of it, wasn't it? Yeah, so there was a huge, you know, there was so much stuff going on for every aspect of this rescue. So should the diving rescue proceed, then all the medical people were rehearsing how they were going to receive the boys. They'd planned a resuscitation template for them, how they were going to affect that. A first aid station in the cave, a field hospital just outside the cave, and then transport down to the local hospital. So, you know, you saw all these ambulance going, ambulances, for example, going up and down the road every day, and they were just practicing the route and doing, getting the timing right. It was, it was very wow. well done. Now, what are these people carrying? Well, that's one of your submersible pumps. With wow. The, yeah. Mate, that could easily weigh a tonne if it's got uh, metal in it. Well, look at these lads carrying it. You know, strong Navy SEALs probably carrying this pump. And I see that bamboo pole looks like it's bending in the middle a bit. So, And, and I never saw one of these things uh, even when I was underwater. But, of course, you're swimming through this water. You've got your hand on the rope. You can't see anything. And you can hear the noise in the distance as you get closer and closer to it. And um, I, you know, I, 
I didn't know whether, I assumed, but I didn't know that the base of this thing would be shielded and I wondered whether my hands might disappear into this thing and, oh, yeah, and, I... and I could feel the electrical cables in the water and I have to say from an OH&S perspective it didn't really feel, <laughs> didn't really feel that, uh, that smart. Well, in Bangkok, if you get onto those boats, they just have a Toyota Corolla engine yes. with the fan blades whizzing away yep. I've 20 seen, centimetres from your head. I've seen the James Bond movie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so they do have a mesh, mesh on this one. And what's happening here? This is the water coming out? Oh, that's the outlet of those pumps again. And that's some of the generators there, I think, those big orange They're huge. Things. Yeah, lots of electricity going in. There was a suggestion that a few guys who were found a bit a bit collapsed in the cave, had been electrocuted at one stage. Um, they didn't like to dwell on that too much, but there was talk of a few guys having a bit of a faint after they touched some stuff. Right. <laughs> wow. Okay, we got some sort of chopper. A uh, very large Russian uh, helicopter which has a quite a large dozer underneath it which gives you a sense of scale so that's a dozer yeah so it's a big that's digger. a dozer so this was being taken up to the top of the mountain a bit of scrub cleared up there and then a drilling rig lowered into the spot and then all these guys had to take the the drill bits you know sections i think they're about three meters long each because you have to be careful not to bend or or scratch them i gather um, they all had to be carried up by hand and using some directional drilling apparatus they tried to drill a hole at a bit of an angle down towards where they thought the boys were. But of course, again, through 800 metres of rock and with a, a map that has been drawn with tape measures and compasses, uh, not, you know, um, you know high tech. Oh, so they could, even if they surveying. got down through 800 metres, they could miss the cave by 5, 10, 20 metres? Exactly. So they, wow. they actually tried that for a few days and then called it off when they realised how unlikely it would be that they would hit the, hit the right spot. OK, that's method number... One, is this method number one and a half or two or? Well, this one I wouldn't really rank on the on the list of serious contenders. Okay, um, I'm seeing a C clamp, uh, a blue C clamp, over there on the left, yep. and a couple of orange nylon ratchet tie down straps holding something onto a cylinder and some people in a underwater with. What, what is this? So actually, to be fair, most cave diving equipment looks a bit like that with. Um, C clamps and ratchet straps holding it all together, but on this but occasion, but there's only two ratchet straps, so if one of them comes loose. You haven't got a backup. That's true. Oh, so like this thing was made or presented by um, that eccentric billionaire from California who makes Musk. Yes, Mr. Musk. Musk. Yeah. Was he involved? Yep. So what well, was I told? I was <laughs> in outer Mongolia, right? Yeah. Okay. See, he rocked up on the site with this um, SpaceX rocket component, and he said to uh, Rick and one of the Yorkshiremen who are probably not as delicate and polite as I am. Um, Rick, uh, Elon said, look, here's this um, rocket component. What you can do is you could take it into the cave where the boys are, just unscrew the nose cone, pop a couple of kids inside, <laughs> screw the nose back on, and then bring the kids out. And Perfect. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. So the Yorkshireman... Um, <laughs> or Yorkshireman, I've heard of ...said, um, no, thank you, Elon, it's not likely to work for, for any other reason but that it won't fit through the restrictions of the cave, which, I mean, the smallest ones were only sort of that big, so we had to wriggle through those. There's no way that this thing would have fitted through. Mm -hmm. But he also hadn't really thought about life support systems, and for someone who sends people to space in his rockets, you'd think he would have had a bit of an idea about oxygen uh, requirements and CO2 and things. I, I think the number of people that have the number of humans that have gone to space in a Musk rocket is so far zero. Oh, OK. There's well, only cargo well, so far. Well, he needs to... Probably still in development then. OK. Mm. So what was he going to do? So How? the Yorkshireman said, no, thank you, Mr Musk. So he's going to unscrew the um, bit on the left-hand so, side. And so something. Elon took this back to the, the local swimming pool with some of his engineers, and to their credit, they put a couple of weight belts on it and a scuba tank to provide some fresh air for the boy inside. Oh, the scuba tank is yeah. the thing held on with the That's orange right. Oki uh, yeah. Nile Richard tie-downs. There's only and, two of them. And um, he brought it back and then the Yorkshireman, I believe, told Elon to stick it where the sun don't shine. <laughs> oh. And then there was a bit of an argy-bargy and Elon might have called him a pedophile and then oh. there, was, there was a lawsuit and that's still ongoing. But anyway. It, oh. It was never a contender, let, but good on him for trying. Let, let, let's go to a higher, yeah, lovely so. level. And so, what on earth are you wearing there on the right? Well, what is all this metal stuff hanging off you and you're wearing 
Oh, you're wearing a summer swimsuit. Not well, a, so we're wearing full-length full wetsuits. Um, yeah, but, you, but your arms aren't covered down. But underneath rest. that, we just wear these wetsuit T-shirts for a bit of extra thermal protection. Because although it's 23 degrees in the cave, we're in there for 12 hours or so, so you get a bit chilled. Yep. Um, and so the wetsuit's basically tied around my waist at that point, and that's the harness that we're wearing to clip the scuba tanks onto our sides. Mm -hmm. We wear our scuba tanks on our sides so we can get through these tight restrictions without uh, things on our back getting hooked up. Oh, on your sides. That's uh, called side mount diving. And, Third um, phrase. Okay. What was the other one? Roof sniff. Roof sniff, side mount diving, speleologist. We'll be experts by the mm. night, yeah. Okay, so what's and that? And helmets with lights, which were of little practical value in the coffee-coloured water. I just turned mine off most of the time and closed my eyes as I was swimming out because there was no point having any lights on at all. How much sleep, your face looks stressed. How much sleep did you get each <laughs> night? I was very relaxed, Carl, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, good couple of hours every night, I would say. You weren't getting eight hours? No, no. Because if you don't sleep your full eight hours, if you just give people an IQ test, they perform significantly worse. So were mm. you really pushing yourself hard just to try and do what had to be done under very trying circumstances with no other options. Well, very long days in the cave, and then we'd come out and there'd be all these briefings and debriefings and meetings until 12 midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. And then finally you'd get your saturated fats with a bit of chicken Get inside. my chicken leg, and then off to bed, and then, you know, you didn't really sleep well in the hotel, listening to the rain on the roof every night, thinking this rain's going to end oh up in God, the cave. The rain. So, well, so it, was, it, was it monsoon now? Yeah, so it's, it's pouring every night. And, of course... Having spoken to Rick and realising that when he arrived, the cave was impenetrable. They couldn't physically get into it. So if the rain started in earnest and the river started to flow properly again, we wouldn't in be able earnest. to get back in. Even though there was a rope? Even with the rope, yeah. You couldn't pull yourself along that? No. Wow. Now, what are these guys here? Um, this is the local dive shop, which is down at the um, entrance to the cave. So there were something like three or four hundred cylinders bought up from around the, the Southeast Asia and brought in for the rescue. You got all the, all, all the local oxygen, oh, sorry, gas cylinders you yep. could get Yep, so all filled with air, except for the ones we put on the boys in the end, which contained 80% uh, oxygen. And we would have put 100% oxygen in them, but we couldn't fill them up with sufficient pressure to do that. So. We just filled them with oxygen up to about three quarters full, which is what the reservoir of gas we had could uh, fill them to, and then top them up with air, ending up at about 80%. Um, and the reason for that was, like any person under anaesthetic, uh, you want them to inspire some an increased level of oxygen. It's uh, protective if they're not breathing particularly deeply or well. And also for the fact that, I, you know, I was so concerned that they were going to drown during this exercise that I thought that if they're full of oxygen and their lungs are full of oxygen and they do drown, then the British diver who's carrying the child through the cave, if they can race through to the next area where there's an air level above the water, then they'll have a better chance of resuscitating the boys if they're primed with oxygen. Um, or, and you can then shove 80% oxygen into them instead of 20%. Yeah, yeah, and it'll give their brain a few more minutes chance, I suppose. Um, so, I mean, scratching it, you know, scratching the bottom of the barrel for, you know, ways to wow. make this safer. But I think it added a, a small level of safety to what we were trying to do. Wow. That's so scary, having to keep on thinking that you've got to plan everything to minimise mm. the depth and if you brought them back alive but they were unable to wake from the coma? Well, there's no such thing as underwater CPR, so, um, you know, they had to be in an area where the diver could do something. There has to be air there. You can't do anything underwater. So I told the divers, if anything happens, if you think there's a problem, all you can do is keep moving forwards and go as fast as you safely can. And at the end of the day, even if the kids drowned, we still had to bring their bodies out. So um, that's the way the, the divers left the, the far end of the cave, knowing that dead or alive, they were going to be bringing one of their boys out. But if they're unconscious and there's a strong water flow and they're being dragged and bumped against things, how do you keep the... Well, what sort of mask is this thing that I'm seeing here in front of me? What was that invented So for? in all the cave rescue training that we do, and I've been running a, um, a course or a training... Um, 
course around bringing out a diver or a caver who's injured in a cave but has got water between them and the entrance. Um, so we've been rehearsing this in various forms for about eight years down at Mount Gambier and we've come to very quickly come to the conclusion that if someone's disabled in any way, even if they're just too cold to look after themselves, you, you can't rely on them to keep a mouthpiece in their mouth. They, they can't, you know, the first thing you're going to do when you become unconscious is the mouthpiece will fall out of your mouth. So we need to have some sort of full face mask, so a mask that seals all the way around their face and um, they can just breathe in and out into the mask. So awake or asleep, that, that sh should still continue. What I'd found though during these training scenarios is though if I pretend to be unconscious, slowly but surely the mask will fill up with water. And for that reason, that was one of the big factors why I told Rick Stanton that I don't believe this can possibly work because I've actually tried it myself essentially. And the water comes in under the yeah, It just leaks the around seal. the mask and you know, um, some of it will go out through the uh, demand valve, the exhaust valve but slowly but surely it ends up getting in your airway. So we knew we had to use full face masks and then we stumbled on the idea of using this particular model which has got a, a positive pressure function and it's what the police divers use, for example, when they're diving in a sewerage pond if they're looking for a body or some the evidence. A sewerage pond? We well, remember our police divers have to pretty much go in wherever the evidence is. So sometimes people throw it in unpleasant places and. I've, I've talked to them about some of the dives in places like sewerage ponds. Um, so you want to make sure that nothing comes into your mask if you're in the, <laughs> in the poop. So this positive pressure function means that if there's a breach in the mask, in the seal of the mask, then air will gush out, but in theory, faeces shouldn't come in. So I thought, well, if it's good enough for those guys, it might help with these um, kids. So. Um, and I think that this is the single piece of equipment that turned what I thought would be certain failure into complete success. Because you've got positive pressure, so if there's any fluid moving in any direction under the seal, that fluid is not water coming in, but gas under pressure going out. But that means Correct. that you're going to be using up the gas in the cylinder faster. Yep. And so if the mask gets knocked or bumped and there's a big breach in the seal, then gas will flood out and the scuba tank will empty very quickly. But that is much better than filling up the kids' lungs with water. And we had plenty of cylinders to change over and, and replace the tanks throughout the cave. Wow. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret that only us doctors know. And part of the training is the following sentence. See one, do one, teach one. If you, there's no, laugh, no, no confidence there from the audience. Oh, no. Yeah. So in this particular case, let me tell you a story that actually relates to that. Um, I um, have a plumber friend who has another plumber friend who has a third plumber friend who is barking mad. <laughs> the third plumber friend lost some keys in a sewer system. And rather than get something like this, um, wrapped his face in a mask and then wrapped his head in a... No, he wrapped his head in a T-shirt and then blocked his nose and then dived into the sewer right. and found the keys and came out and spent the next three months in hospital. Why? 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 He had all sorts of stuff got into his body and made him so sick. Right. So you've avoided that entirely with this wonderful invention. Mm. Wow. Mm. So uh, that made it possible. Well, I think that's the single bit of equipment. As well as all of the dedication the and the hard yeah. work and the yeah. taking risks. Mm. But if, if that hadn't been available... So there were hundreds of masks sent from all around the world. Uh, the military, US military bought a heap of them. Uh, the Australian Federal Police had some. Dive shops from all around Asia were sending masks. And they were all sorted through. And these, this was the one model that had this particular function. And there were only four of them. So four. that was the rate limiting step, actually, for the rescue. You mean four in the whole world that you could get your hands well, on? Exactly. Oh, at that yeah, time? at that time. At that time, that was very you short get notice, yeah. in the whole world. Wow. OK, what's this? So this is one of the millions of meetings that seemed like I had to go to. Um, <laughs> when you could have been sleeping and eating the hot food. So this is the, so the first day that Craig and I dived the cave, I wanted to actually see the cave for myself, see the children for myself, get it into my head that this was in any way remotely possible. And I couldn't do that in the abstract. I had to 
go and visit the children for myself. And, and there was a lot of pressure on Craig and I to come down to the pool to be involved in that experiment with the kids in the pool that we just showed the photo with the, the child with the full face mask. Um, but we insisted on going to visit the children. And then that night, having seen the kids and seeing actually how healthy they looked, what, what really good shape they appeared to be in. They had no food? They, they, they um, had no food? They had no food at all for nine days until they were found. And then Rick and John had a couple of sort of muesli bars and things they gave them. But then the next day they came back with quite a lot of uh, food, some meals ready to eat from the US Air Force. Uh, so they uh, were pretty well fed for the subsequent days. And of course, the byproduct of that was that their local environment deteriorated pretty quickly and made it <laughs> less and less pleasant for us to visit. But, so um, sewage into the water and then up to downstream. Yep. Wow. And so this is a. So this is a meeting on that night after Craig and I have dived, and we're basically our, our role was not to tell the Thais how to how to do this rescue. It was just to offer this is a diving solution that we're prepared to attempt and you can put that in the mix and you, we'll do it if you want or you can do something else. How, how many days <coughs> after the first Saturday is this? So this is two weeks exactly since the kids two disappeared. Two weeks? Yeah, day 14. And it's still raining out of the sky every still day? Still raining and the weather forecast is giving us a two to three day window and we've got a minimum of three days work to do to get these kids out if we're going to dive them. Wow. So that meeting basically was sort of high level Thai leadership. The Minister for the Interior was there and the King's Guard and the Prime Minister was there on the telephone and they told us all, thanks very much. Uh, it was about one o'clock in the morning. They said, go away and get some sleep <laughs> and um, we will make our decision overnight and tell you in the morning whether you're going to be doing this or not. So that night I got the Thai medical and nursing staff to prepare all the medications for me um, in the event we were going ahead. It needed to be very carefully, carefully pre-drawn and pre-packaged for the, myself and for the British divers to use. And then the next morning um, we're waiting to hear whether the plan's going ahead. This is about eight o'clock in the morning. We're having a meeting just with the cave divers. And this is me giving them the anaesthesia 101 lesson. Really? Now, if you look at the look on Rick Stanton's face there, just by my right hand, yeah. you'll remember that this was his idea, actually, this whole sedation thing. Yep. So I would have thought he could have looked a little bit more engaged than he is. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll get to the sedation thing. So this next picture gives an idea of what's going to happen next. So this was the plan as we saw it coming together. I mean, there was quite some, some quite robust discussions within robust. the cave diving group about what the best way to do it. You know, two divers, one child, you know, one person, one, one child. We ended up deciding that we would space the kids out with a decent interval um, and one British diver would take each child from chamber nine where I would anaesthetise them all the way through the cave to chamber three which was the last one part of the One person would have responsibility. Yep, all that way. And we would... It's good that we have responsibility yeah, for one person. And, and we would station all the other cave divers along the route so they could assist that British diver every time he popped up into an air chamber. Because they had somebody who spoke their language and... Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So this was the way the plan came together. And so the British diver would keep one hand on the rope, remembering that, in fact, you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. um, he would have an arm round the child. The child would have a scuba tank strapped to their front so they'd have their own supply of gas which couldn't be separated from them. To the front or the side? To the front in this case. Yep. Um, and the full face mask on, as you can see. And we decided to put the scuba tank on the front so that they would be nice and balanced and it would act like a keel oh. so they would be in perfect trim going through the water and nice and streamlined. Because if um, it was on the side, they wouldn't be in trim. Yeah, they'd roll over and be hard to manage. I hadn't even thought of that. Yep. You and thought of that? Yeah, we, thought, we thought of everything, yeah. Carl. <laughs> wow. But hang on. If, I've, if I'm grabbing you with one hand and I'm grabbing the rope with the other hand, every now and then I have to let go of the rope to grab it further along, so... That did prove to be a problem. Um, so one of the British guys lost the rope in the most difficult oh, section of cave and he basically spent 15 minutes, he reckons, swimming around with 15 no, vis minutes. no visibility with his child starting to wake up and um, completely off the line, didn't know where he was, gas running out. You know, it's a, I mean, it is a dangerous environment if things aren't going 
He couldn't well. have a running carabiner, a big carabiner we, loop to you? We, we've sort of tried that historically, being physically clipped to the line, but like inevitably, it, yeah, inevitably it causes more problems than you think you're solving. You know, you get to a point where it's difficult to pass something or you get tangled up or... Um, so we've found just keeping in contact with the line. I mean, you're pretty motivated to do that, obviously. Yeah. And, and how did he find the line after 15 minutes? Well, he, he didn't. In fact, he did what we do, what we call uh, cave diving term number four, the lost line drill. Lost? Lo there will be an exam. Mm. <laughs> I'm expecting you to get 80%. The lost line drill. Okay, so we do have it. a system for finding the line when we've lost it. Yep. And, you know, it's like when you're bushwalking, if you get lost, the first thing you don't do is just go running off in the, any random direction. You kind of make ground zero, you mark where you are, and you search in a methodical way from that point. And we've got a way of doing that underwater, even in zero visibility. But despite doing all the right things, he couldn't find the rope again. The rope had actually pinged back away from him into a tiny crack oh. out of his reach. And um, we knew this part of the cave was particularly treacherous in that regard. But despite that, this, this happened. Anyway, so he's searching around. He feels down on the ground because he's quite close to the chamber three where all the people are waiting. And he feels one of these cables, electricity cables, on the ground. Oh, you're kidding! <laughs> so he thinks, well, this is good news. At least I've got something that must be going in and out of the cave. So he starts following it, but unfortunately, you know, 50% chance he ends up going the wrong direction and he goes back into the cave. But he finally pops up into chamber four um, and uh, he's in the air, so, you know, the heat's off for the moment. But I was coming out last. And meanwhile, the last, the last diver with the last child had actually passed him underwater without them realising. Oh, you're kidding. They'd gone just past each other. That would have uh, caused such... Confusion. Well, fortunately, they were far enough apart not to get tangled, but sadly, they weren't close enough together for him to get assistance and follow the, the other guy out. Right. So this guy's gone out. This guy called Chris has actually come, come back in, and I'm swimming out at the end of the day thinking this was the very last child of the whole shooting match. I'm sort of alone with my thoughts, thinking there's a chance that, you know, it's all, it's all finished now. I'm happy. And I see this guy, and he's white as a sheet. He's obviously had a very near miss underwater. He has. He has had a near miss. He could have died. And, um, and he sounded, you know, upset. And I said, you all right? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Um, I said, is the child all right? Yeah, he's, he's waking up. We need to re-anesthetise him, which we did. And then um, he told me what had happened. So I actually took the child from him at that point. Um, and exactly the same thing happened to me in exactly the same point. You're kidding. Um, even with that knowledge, and I could picture the spot in my mind where it had happened and why it had happened. So I very carefully, because you get to this point where you, you, your hand's on the rope and you, you can't follow the rope because the gap is literally like that where the rope goes. So you have to pull the rope as hard as you can and then reach over to the right as far as you can and feel the hole that you have to find your way through. But of course, you've got this kid sort of not to lose at the same time. So you what lose I did was points for losing the kid. You do lose. That's kind of the whole game. <laughs> so I put the rope under my arm and then held onto the kid with this hand and then reached over, found the hole, went through it. Happy days. Where's my rope? I can't find my rope. I've lost it. And this is exactly what had happened to, to Chris. <gasps> and I spent about two minutes doing that same thing, feeling around, doing my doing my drill, I started to think, I can't, I can't believe this has happened to me. And I found the cable on the floor. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, at least I know which way is forward still because I hadn't got that turned around. Yep. So I was just about to start to follow this thing out when I felt something and I reached over and the rope was actually still tucked in my armpit. Oh. But despite my best efforts searching, you know, I must have been going like this but <laughs> all around it but not on it. So oh. anyway, happy days, it was all good. Now, we, we're sort of running out of time, so we won't dwell too much on the ketamine, but the ketamine is what they call a... Dis oh, I've done some reading up on this. Mm -hmm. A dissociative anaesthetic, so that while it does make you sleepy, it still leaves well, your breathing reflexes I have to say, okay. and I know there are a couple of anaesthetists in this room, I don't really understand what that means myself, but somehow it disconnects your cortex from your brainstem. So you still keep on breathing? You still breathe, your, your brainstem works well, um, your blood pressure and your cardiovascular system are quite stable. It's an incredibly forgiving drug, particularly in the hands of firemen and, and rope access workers and dive instructors, as I found out. And so you said, how do you tell them where to inject it? Uh, so keep it simple, I just told them just 
jab it in the outside of their thigh. Outer um, thigh, yep. Just uh, there's nothing there that you, that you can uh, do any damage. The only thing you can do wrong is to squirt it into the wetsuit because it probably won't work there. Right. So you've got to get it into the meat of their leg. If you, so you um, went straight through the wetsuit? Yeah, through okay, the so, wetsuit. So what does this next photo show So this is just one photo. I'll quickly ask everyone in the crowd not to photograph this image if you wouldn't mind just because it's... Um, I, For various I just reasons. feel sensitive about it. Okay. But, so I took a, a video of the last anaesthetic that I did in the cave and I thought to myself, this doesn't really feel like the right thing to be doing to anaesthetising me doing a... Uh, basically with one of my patients, but then I thought, I probably won't be doing this again, so let's just get a quick video. Anyway, so that's me in the white helmet. Um, the child is anaesthetised. I've put the syringes on the right there into the... Uh, wow, hang on. Into, so the, into the Sharps the... container. Hello. So no. we're so well trained, Carl. Don't prick any of the, the other staff with your injection. So. Right. So they're in the mud there. So that child's anaesthetised now. Uh, we've put the full face mask on after they're asleep. Chris, who's the guy I'm about to follow and have this adventure in the red helmet, he has, um, uh, is putting the uh, cylinder on the front of the child. And then after that happens, um, one of the other British divers is actually going to take this kid. Uh, so they'll put their gear on. I'll float the child face down in the water and make sure that no water's getting into the mask. And I'll do a few experiments to make sure that's the case. Lift the kid's face up and check the mask. And then we decided we'd tie the kid's hands behind their backs um, just so they'd be nice and streamlined and also tie their ankles together. So they're like a dart, basically, as streamlined as possible, pushing them through the water with the minimum of effort. And if they wake, and if they wake up, they won't accidentally start using their hands to tear the mask off. Exactly. And more importantly, to be honest, that they won't try and drown the, the rescue diver, which is kind of rule number one in the emergency services, is don't kill the rescuers. Mm. So, as you know, it all worked, and this is a photo of one of the boys in Chamber 3. When, so, as soon as we got to Chamber is 3... Is there a boy under that? Yes. Yeah, so Where? Th number one there is the, on the side of the full face mask. The kids' feet are down the right-hand side of the, the slide. Wow. And as soon as we pop up into Chamber 3, we can hand the child over then, because the diving's finished, and all the um, American Air Force paramedics are there, and uh, Thai medics, and so they took over the child, popped him in one of these stretchers, and then they still had about 600 metres of dry caving rescue. Dry caving? So it was no... There was wet dry caving. It was so a, we, still a river. Yeah. And what was it? Nose roof sniffing? Roof sniffing. Roo they, they had to do a some couple roof of roof sniffs sniff. okay, on the right. way out. Now we've got to move to the Q&A section. So what have we yep. got here? So that's just some of the rigging for the dry cave rescue. I mean, this, this part of the rescue was quite phenomenal in its own right. Uh, it took about an hour and a half to get the kids out through this section. It took an hour and a half? Yep to run them underwater from Chamber 9 to Chamber... Uh, about three hours from Chamber 9 to Chamber 3, underwater. Th three hours? Yep. And about an hour and a half from Chamber 3 to the outside world. you had world. to keep on squirting them with ketamine? Yeah, each kid had about between three and five top-ups. Wow. OK, we'll, we'll ask, get the audience on that. These are some of your... Out to the field medical hospital. Ah. Bit of resuscitation and stabilisation, and then into an ambulance. Ambulance. Helicopter. Helicopter. Hospital. Hospital. KFC. Beautiful. <laughs> KFC. And you're wearing a mask. How nice of you. Well, so my, if you could see in my boots, they were about two inches deep in mud, um, but uh, hospital protocol dictated that we had to wear a mask to visit the children in case <laughs> we infected them with, you know, spelunkers. Disease oh, or I didn't say the word. No. Not me. No, no way. Uh, but this boy is just worth mentioning. I mean, he's kind of my favourite and I think everyone's favourite and he summarises the whole result up to me. His name is Titan, uh, an unlikely nickname for a 30 kilo boy who um, probably has to grow into that name a little bit yet. Um, yeah. But he had eyes for his four bowls of, of Thai food and not much time for me, I have to say, but it was, <laughs> it was nice to see him and his friends all doing really well. And... One thing about it, you have proven that you have at least one opposable thumb. There we are. Yeah. Think, yeah. And then over here? Uh, well, this was um, about a month later when we all got to visit the, the GG in, in, in Canberra. And Governor General. Yeah, so that's the Australian Federal Police divers and uh, a Navy clearance diver who we shared this extraordinary adventure with. Wow. Well, that's sort of taken us 
all the way through. Now, Callista, I'm not too sure of our timing. Uh, Callista is named after the one of the nine muses in mythology. And so do you want to take over the timing from here? And, we'll, and we, do we have microphones for the audience? We do. We, we'll just take a couple of questions because I'm very conscious... Have we been very bad? Very bad with the time? Such an insight yeah. into what's happened. But uh, honestly, I had no idea that it was so deep. And so do we have time for a couple of questions? Okay. okay. Raise your we'll hands. Take five, I think. Who would like to go first? Uh, hand waving behind. Yeah, sorry, there. hand waving, and um, we microphone do have microphones. Running to it. We'll ask you to. Um... And here comes the first question. Okay. Uh, a question with sorry. the uh, the dive through. How many times did you have to change cylinders over and set your stage cylinders up? And did that differ between? yours as a rescue diver and the cylinders that you needed for the, um, uh, the soccer players? Yeah, so we dived with three cylinders each, um, which was more than enough to get us to the end of the cave and back. It was only five metres deep, so not a lot of gas to be used. And we had multiple cylinders throughout the cave, all staged uh, just in case. And actually the kids, because they were breathing so little and they were so small, uh, under the anaesthetic, they they use less than one cylinder of gas. They're really just sipping sipping at it, so not much at all. Would have been much more complex in a deeper cave. So I've got a question at the back, and then I think we had a question down here as well. Yes. Couldn't bring them all out on the one day. How come we couldn't? Uh, we only had the four masks, so that was the rate limiting step, and. Um, we had about a 45 minute gap between each kid. We didn't want to get people bottlenecked in any of the restrictions. If someone got stuck and had a problem, the last thing they want is another diver and a boy coming up their backside. And um, with a three hour transit time, there wasn't enough time to turn it around and repeat in, in a single day. So how many days did that take? Four days? Three days of rescue dives, yep. But your heart must have been in your mouth all that way when the first lot came through alive and you were thinking, please let them all be alive. Well, I didn't know if anyone was alive until I came out at the end of the day, obviously. Yep. Got another question here. Yes. Sorry, um, who's that? Hey, talk loudly into the microphone. That's all right, we can repeat the question. If um, I was just wondering about the language that you used. What, how were you communicating? Which language? So, um, which, which language, how did we communicate? Um, one, one, there were three Thai Navy SEALs and a Thai military doctor in the cave with the boys by the time I got there. They'd gone in just after the British guys found them. That's kind of a whole other story around that because they didn't uh, manage that side of things all that well. They could have easily died themselves. But anyway, they managed to get to the kids and they were kind of just as stuck as the kids were in the end. Um, but anyway, one of the doctor was an amazing guy and he spoke quite good English, so I could explain everything through him what was going to happen to the kids. And I pretty much gave him a dot point recipe of the way we were going to approach it. And I was watching the kids' faces whilst the doctor explained that to them. And honestly, they were just like, yep, no worries. <laughs> we're ready. Not, not any sign of anxiety or trembling lip or any, any crying. They were just, I'm, I'm sure, after two weeks sitting on this bit of mud of sort of five by two metres, they would have done anything to get out of there. So, and of course, once they're asleep, no need for further communication. So, so there were 13 of them on a platform five metres by two metres. I would say, yeah. And that was their home for... Two afford? weeks. Wow. Yeah. It was a dreadful place, yeah. Mm. You've got to keep the audience happy. <laughs> We've got um, Kim in front of you, and Lady would like to ask a question. You're in some uh, pretty revolting conditions. What sort of medication, you know, antibiotics or other kinds of um, treatments did you and other divers require to prevent illness in yourselves? Um, nothing at all, actually. We were fine. I mean, how, how we escaped a dose of gastro, I'm not sure. But apart from that, you know, there were no... No real issues. I mean, the kids didn't even get any... I, I was sure they might get some abscesses or something from the injection sites, given the condition of the water where their first injection was in particular. But they didn't even, didn't even get a bruise. Uh, perfect. Oh, that's because you were so good. That's right, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think we've got one last question down the front here. Does it take a, a special type of person uh, not to panic when um, they're stuck? Under, um, under a mountain in a cave and can't see, can't, you know, can't figure out where they are. Is this something you have to get used to? Or yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a 
special kind of person. I think it's a very slow um, accumulation of experience, very incremental in increase in your experience. You know, if I did the sort of, d tried to do the diving I do now when I first started cave diving, I wouldn't survive a minute because of that, that fear and, and, and danger of panic. So that's why you just build up experience very slowly, increase your tolerance to those sort of situations. The diving training we do as cave divers is actually very thorough. You don't really see anything dur during your course. They've got a blindfold on you for almost the entire course, or they've ripped your mask off anyway. So um, by the time you finish your, your cave diving training, you're pretty used to not, being see not, not seeing anything at all anyway. So. Um, and remember, this is what we do on the weekends. We do do this for fun. So. Um, <laughs> So I, there was nothing particularly special about the diving in this cave per se, apart from the risk of imminent flooding, which was a major concern, I guess. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Carl and Richard. Now, I remember last July being transfixed, watching the TV along with the rest of the world, or hearing it on the radio, that is for except Dr Carl. Um, I thought I knew a little bit about the terrain and the complexity and the risks, but I think um, by measuring the gasps and the size in the audience tonight, um, I don't think I had any understanding until uh, actually looking at those photos and hearing you talk about the experience personally. So thank you very much, um, Richard, for sharing your experience. And thank you very much, Dr. Carl, for actually asking all the questions, which I'm sure are on the tip of most of our tongues. I would now like to... Thank you, Callista, and good evening all. Well. I think we can all agree that we've wit witnessed something pretty special here to you, pretty uh, special here tonight. A unique conversation between uh, two extraordinary people um, and extraordinary communicators. A one-off event that hopefully will never be repeated at least uh, due to this uh, previous event. I'd like to thank Carl first who, with a plethora of degrees, including physics, medicine, combined with a diverse career path, as well as author, to list a few, physicist, filmmaker, medical doctor, perhaps more importantly, style icon. <laughs> Looking at those shoes, portrait model, seemed like the most qualified person to understand what it takes when you combine formal training uh, with passions and obtaining amazing results. Dr. Carl, our speaker Richard tonight, did share with us earlier that many of his own family here in the front row came along this evening to offer their support, but their real reason for coming was to see you. We should acknowledge in the audience we have Fiona, his wife, uh, who was also another Flinders alumnus and who I think probably shared a lot of travails as she wondered what on earth was happening far away. And I think we should acknowledge uh, her support and also... And sons Charlie and James, who are also here, whom I'm sure also knew that their father was bonking mad most of the time, but on TV it was recognition that everybody knew that he was bonking mad, but actually providing extraordinary support to so many people. I think it's fair to say on behalf of most of our audience, indeed all, we're truly honoured to enjoy this evening tonight. Can I please ask you all to join with me in thanking Dr. Cowell for his important contribution to tonight's lecture. Tonight was behind the scenes insight into an event that not only captured the eyes and hearts of the world, but demonstrated how a unified approach to a situation that at first seemed hopeless was turned around by applying specialist knowledge from a blend of the sciences. Anesthesia, 
human physiology and physics all came together with a good dose of psychology and also ingenuity. And I suspect, Harry, when you graduated from your medical course, you had no idea the sorts of adventures and uh, um, extraordinary contribution that you will have made over time. That international rescue changed lives, kept families together, and brought people and countries around the world to witness humanity triumphing over adversity. And I think the story you told about those farmers and the contribution that they also made was telling to many of us. So we're here also to recognize uh, Harry uh, in terms of the Flinders University Alumni Awards. And these recognize the significant contribution made by Flinders alumni to the university, the community, or within their chosen field locally and overseas. We are pleased to announce Dr. Richard Harris as one of our 2018 Distinguished Alumni Award recipients earlier this year. And tonight is a perfect occasion to present the award um, uh, in front of an appropriate crowd whilst also thanking him for such a memorable evening. So on behalf of Flinders University, it gives me great pleasure to, to announce Dr. Richard Harris, S-C-O-A-M, as the recipient of a Distinguished Alumni Award recipient for his outstanding service to the international community through his specialist response role during the 2018 Tam Lung Cave Rescue in Thailand. Dr. Harris, please come and accept your award. From our Deputy Chancellor and Chair of the Alumni Award Nomination Committee, Elizabeth Perry, and Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research Rob, Professor Robert Saint, who you saw all earlier. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Dr. Harris, please take a moment to address the audience. Uh, you would think a man who has been described as brave for being in the cave would not fear such occasions, but um, I can tell you one secret is uh, um, uh, addressing people in this way fills me with fear more than almost anything else in life. Um, but it is a wonderful opportunity to um, uh, ac accept this award from uh, my university, which was a place of that I remember with great fondness and... Um, and pleasure, uh, a place where I was fortunate enough to meet my wife uh, and um, who was uh, a very, very close friend for many years before um, uh, we became more romantically involved. And so um, Flinders University holds so many fabulous memories for me, um, both academically, where I was perhaps not the greatest student of all time, but I pursued uh, equally important things like the Flinders Underwater, uh, Flinders University Underwater Club, where I definitely excelled. Um, <laughs> and um, it was in fact at university that I started my, my interest in cave diving in 1985 with some fellow instructors from the university. So it was a really uh, important time for me and uh, wonderful to uh, see people like one of my old professors, Professor Radford here, who uh, I've already mentioned to him, I remember very clearly uh, his talks about the wilds of PNG when he was uh, working there and one of his classic photographs of what can only be described as a very massive garfish penetrating the abdomen of uh, some poor local fisherman and he used to show such, such photos like that which for me, combining my love of the ocean and medicine in one graphic photograph <laughs> made me uh, inspired to do more than just um, sit in a consulting room for the rest of my life. So. Uh, to him and all of the other faculty at the university, I say thank you, and um, uh, it really was a wonderful time. Um, thank you to everyone who's, who's been involved in organising this evening. Thank you to Dr Carl, who it's been an absolute treat to meet and spend some time with it. My brain cannot even begin to keep up with the pace of his uh, synapses. 
um, which, uh, which uh, fire at uh, a phenomenal rate and um, uh, quite an extraordinary man. It's been a wonderful experience to share the, the stage with him. Um, thank you to Laurie O'Brien for the, for the welcome and um, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, one of Laurie's sons recently at another uh, function and uh, so slowly but surely working my way around the O'Brien family, uh, meeting them all and they're tremendously good, good humoured and wonderful people. Um, so um, finally, just very proud to have my family here tonight to share um, this with me. They've heard this story so many times they could have written the book themselves for me by now and I'm sure they're completely over the whole thing but um, they haven't been to many of the functions, so it's great to, to have the whole extended family here with me tonight. So um, thank you very much for the, for the award, and thanks everyone for attending tonight. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the, this evening with us. Thank you. Uh, and just on a final note, thank you once again, um, Jonathan and Rob, and also our Deputy Chancellor, Elizabeth Perry, who also uh, chairs our alumni um, committee. We also have a number of our alumni recognition committee here with us tonight, so I'd also like to extend a thank you to Gossier Hill, Greg Mackey, Anne Morris, and Sam Taylor. Thank you very much for the time that you give to ensure our graduates are actually recognised for their achievements, whether they're local or they're global. It was the university's founding vice-chancellor, Professor Peter Carmel, who in 1966 stated that Flinders University was being established to experiment and experiment bravely. And I think he'd agree that Richard Harris epitomised his statement during this brave and courageous act we heard so much about tonight. Thank you all for joining us here this evening. Thank you for being such good humoured guests and please travel safely home. <laughs>